So behind me, as we continue our story, um, uh, you know, we're at, at the, we've reached the darkest period of the, of the 24 hours, uh, the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. And over the last five weeks, we've been talking about Jesus from the Passover meal on the Thursday when he met with his disciples and ate dinner with them, did the last supper, what we call the Last Supper. And then he went from there to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is across the valley to where he prayed. And um, that's where uh, Pilate, or he, uh, Judas betrayed him. He was arrested. Uh, he was taken to Pilate then back across the valley into Jerusalem, into um, uh, the, 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 the place that the big house that Caiaphas was at, the high priest palace. And so he was there. Uh, he was there and was in their courtyard where he was uh, tried by the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders. And he was taken from there, uh, another walk to the Antonia Fortress, which was the place where um, Pilate uh, ran the government, the Roman government of the, of the Israelis or the, the Jewish people from there. And he was tried by Pilate. Pilate actually says he doesn't find anything wrong with him, but then he turns him over to be crucified anyway. Uh, and then they go from the big... Uh, public place to the other side of the Antonia Fortress, there's another big public space, and that's where the soldiers, there was a full garrison of soldiers that lived there right on the temple wall, and as, as they went into this other area, then the soldiers uh, uh, flogged Jesus, uh, they made fun of him, they pulled his beard out, they did everything they could think of to make him, to make his life more miserable, more hurtful, more painful, and and uh, to humiliate him. And that's not even the worst part of the story. How sad is that? So today, our, our, our Scripture takes place on top of this. This is uh, what they call, if you'll notice in the middle right there by the, the wings of the cross, you can see the two dark spices, the holes, the cavities in the rock, and then on the bottom there's another piece. And then, so that would be the eyes and then the mouth on the bottom. This is what they, the reason they call this hill there at the, outside the edge of, of Jerusalem, Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. So this would be like the, the eye holes and then the mouth hole in, in a skull. Uh, so that's the reason uh, that we have this in the background. So you kind of get an idea this, this crucifixion would have taken place on top of this hill, which is right outside the walls of, of Jerusalem. So my aim today is uh, to, help us, uh, to help us see the crucifixion of Jesus and to, uh, so that we better know the price that Jesus paid, uh, by the, the price that was paid by God Himself and Jesus Christ for our salvation. I want to help us understand the crucifixion without being overly graphic. I'm not going to get into all the gory details. I don't think we need to do that today. But I do think we need to understand what this means for us today and what the cost was for our grace and the salvation that we have. Our scripture is in Mark chapter 15, starting with verse 25. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The notice of the formal charge against him was written, the king of the Jews. They crucified two outlaws with him, one on his right and one on his left. People walking by insulted him shaking their heads and saying, Ha! So you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, were you? Save yourself. Come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests were making fun of Him among themselves, together with the legal experts. He saved others, they said, but He can't save Himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, who come down from the cross, then we'll see and believe. Even those who had been crucified with Jesus insulted Him. From noon till three in the afternoon, the whole earth was dark. At three, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eloi, Eloi, lama, sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you left me or why have you forsaken me? And after hearing him, some standing there said, look, he's calling Elijah. 
And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on a pole. He offered it to Jesus to drink, saying, let's see if Elijah will come and take him down. But Jesus let out a loud cry and died. The curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from the top to the bottom. When the centurion who stood facing Jesus saw how he died, he said, this man was certainly God's Son. Since Jesus' death was by crucifixion, I think we need to look uh, for just a, at least a few minutes this morning at what crucifixion was. The Roman crucifixion was, was not designed to put a criminal to death quickly. Matter of fact, it's the extreme opposite of anything humane. It was designed to prolong a person's agony and, and, and suffering just as long as possible. And, and that's why Seneca said uh, of crucifixion, if you knew you were going to be crucified, it would be better that you committed suicide. Cicero said this, this was extreme and, and ultimate punishment and the cruelest and most disgusting penalty. And then another uh, Another uh, historian from, from the period about the time that Jesus was there watching these, Josephus said this, it was the most pitiable of all deaths. A crucifixion, and, and this one of Jesus, took place at a busy intersection outside the city walls so that as many as people, as many people as, as you could would see it. I mean, it was meant to deter uh, people from committing similar crimes. Uh, you know, they think you, when they see this, they would say, man, I never ever want to do whatever that person did uh, to, to have that happen to me. So for over a hundred years, over a hundred years, the Romans, instead of finding ways to be more loving, caring, gracious, giving persons, they had been perfecting for a hundred years, they'd been perfecting the process of tormenting people and keeping them alive as long as possible while ensuring that they were going to die. The process, I think, represents humanity at its very worst. And so there was always a sign placed on the cross because they wanted people to understand why this person was having such a terrible death. So, and a cross up on the cross, the top of this, uh, above where the head would be, uh, they always had a sign. So, that, so you would know, a sign for this person did this. And so a person walks by and they're going, man, I'm not doing that. That was the, the purpose, part of the purpose for keeping them alive for so long. Some of these crucifixions, these people would hang on this cross, sometimes for a full day, 24 hours, they would be say, hanging on this cross. And so there'd be a sign. So, so the two guys, the, the people beside Jesus, as they're being crucified with Jesus, again, this was a normal uh, thing that they did in those days, the, the they would have said uh, a robber or murderer. So they would head up there and then people would go by and say, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that. But Jesus, you remember what the sign was that Jesus had across his? It said, the king of the Jews. The king of the Jews. That was what he was accused of. Somebody thought they heard him say that he was going to be the king of the Jews and that's what they chose to use to crucify him. Now, on the, on the Roman cross, there were two pieces, as, as there is with any cross, but the, the vertical part of the cross was, was a part that would stay at the, at the side of the crucifixion. It would be too heavy to carry around very far, and so it would be there, and I promise you, nobody's taking it. Nobody wants to get close to it if they don't have to. And so it's going to lay there, and then the, when Jesus carried His cross to, uh, to Golgotha, to the, to the cross, that, that, or the hill or the mount of the, of the skull, then he would have carried this cross beam, this, this horizontal beam. Now, those would be a little bit larger than this as far as being around. This probably weighs, this horizontal beam here weighs maybe uh, 40 pounds. The, the piece that he would have weighed would have been bigger. It would have weighed about 75 to 100 pounds uh, when he carried that. And as he was carrying that, that piece the, up the, the Via Della Rosa, and he was carrying it, the, the horizontal piece there to to the place where he would be crucified. They were doing that. Part of the reason they did that was to inflict as much emotional damage 
They wanted to wear them out so that the... Remember, they've studied this for 100 years. And so they were trying to get them worn out enough by carrying this and all the pain from that so that they would have trouble hanging on the cross. And we'll talk about that just, just, just for a moment in, in a minute. But remember, Jesus carried the cross as far as He could, this horizontal piece as far as He could. And when He couldn't carry it any farther, then Simon of Cyrene was called from the crowd and, and was told to carry it. And so Simon of Cyrene carried it for Jesus to the site of the crucifixion. And so when, when the Roman soldiers brought Jesus and laid Him flat on the cross, they would be laying down. They would put these, tie these two pieces together. And with His feet straddling for balance, then you know, we often picture Jesus with holes in His hands uh, that you know, they put the nails in here. But, but I'll do His hands so it's not as distracting. So, so, but you, you can't do that because that would, that would pull out because of the weight of a human person that would pull out. And so, what they believe they would do is they would put it in, they would put this in the, the wrist. And so here was a couple of things about putting the nail in the wrist is they had to make sure that they missed the vein because if you hit the vein, they would bleed out and die too quickly. And the whole idea was to make them be as, as, as miserable for as long as they can. It, but, but there are a lot of nerves going through there. And so they were sure to hit some nerves. And so it would be excruciating it would be excruciating pain as they would hang there. And so actually, uh, actually the, the word crucifixion comes from the Latin word excruciation. Uh, or excruciating comes from the word crucifixion, and the Latin word for that. So you can see that the whole, the very name for dying this way was basically the ex most excruciating way they could find to kill someone. So once the once the, the wrists were nailed in place, the victim's heels then would be would be uh, nailed in place on the sides of the cross. And and uh, if you want to find out more of this, if you if you like to look at that stuff, uh, there's uh, several places to go. But one of the places where I've gone for a lot of this is is Adam Hamilton uh, has a couple of books out that has some of this in it. One of them is the 24 Hours to Change the World, which we took this title for the series from. And so you can find out more information on that if, if, if you want to know that. But when the victim hung on the cross, two things happened. The pain on the wrist would become so bearable as they would hold themselves up that they would, they would be pulled down. And so the, this is an eight-foot cross. And, and the crosses of that day, the Roman crosses, would stick up out of the ground about six to nine feet. And so the, the, the person being crucified then would be here and they'll be through the, their arms here, and they would they'd be here like this. And, and I'm about six foot, and, and most of the Jewish people in that day were just over five foot. So this would be about the height they would be. And they wasn't like you were like some other place, and people had to pay five dollars and walk by, you know, uh, and, and get the binoculars out to see what was going on. This was done right here, right in the place, right in front of people, where you could see it, where you could smell it, and you could hear it. They wanted you this close because they wanted you to understand that you don't want this to happen to you. And so they would hang here. And so the person would hang here and they would hold themselves up because you can't breathe when your arms are too high. And so when the pain would become so excruciating and they just couldn't hold themselves anymore, they would drop down and then they couldn't breathe. And so for six hours, Jesus hung there and was doing this writhing really, of between holding himself up enough to breathe, lowering himself down because the pain was so excruciating he couldn't stand it one more second and then not being able to breathe. And so that was what Jesus did for, for, for six hours. That's, that's what this instrument was for. The Roman crosses, like I said, were... were uh, about this tall, a little bit bigger around probably than this, but, but, but they wanted you to know. They wanted you to see. And, and so all the insults that were hurled at Jesus would be right there. The guard that was there was not there to, uh, to keep you from messing with them. The guard was there. The Roman guard would stay there to make sure that, that nobody did anything to them so they're to, 
cause their pain to be less. They didn't want you to uh, kill them or something so they could go ahead and die in peace. They wanted this excruciating pain, uh, excruciating pain to continue for the full length of time. And so that's the cross. Okay? So in Luke's Gospel, Jesus looked at those who had crucified Him, the people who were insulting Him, the, 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 the thieves on His left and His right that were there, the chief priests who come by and, and He had been in the synagogue with and yet they were coming and they were, they were yelling at Him. Guards were at the foot of the cross gambling for his clothes. He looks at all of that and he begins to pray. And he says, Father, if I ever get down from here, I'm going to get every one of these no good people that are yelling at me. You know that's not the truth. What did Jesus pray? Now, that might be our prayer, that might be our thoughts. But what did Jesus pray? Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. Okay, now all this is going on. He's in such pain, He can barely breathe. He can barely stand it. Six hours. And He prays a prayer. And His prayer is, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. You know, I know there are places in Scripture that talk about the wrath of God and, and, and God's anger against sin. Not against humans, but against sin. But in Jesus' crucifixion, what we see here is God's mercy and forgiveness. And I tell you, from my perspective, and I think all of our perspective, if there was ever a time that God would be justified in having wrath, it would be when His Son is hanging on the cross. But yet, that's when we see God's mercy and forgiveness. That's when we see Jesus praying for those who have done this to Him. Let me stop for a second because I think sometimes we think we've done some things that's just right next to unforgivable if it's not totally unforgivable. And we just wonder if God could ever forgive us. Listen, you haven't physically driven nails into His wrists and His heels. But God forgave the people that did that. Jesus forgave the people that did that to Him while He was still hurting and in anguish. So whatever it is that any one of us has done, God forgives you. God is willing and more than able to forgive you for that. God, he says, Father, you know, even if you had done that, God, thought that Jesus is there saying, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. If Jesus is willing to forgive them in that moment, you know, sometimes it's easier to come back once the pain's gone and say, Oh, it wasn't too bad. I'll forgive you. But in the moment, in the moment, Jesus even then could say, Father, forgive them. I think this is a great picture of God's mercy, how God loves us. How God cares for us. Now, after this, Jesus says this. Matthew, the Gospels of Matthew and Mark give us the, the next words of Jesus. And after hanging on the cross for hours, he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, Jesus was human, but he was also divine. And so he knew, he knew that he would not be totally left there by himself. He had to know that. I mean, he was one with the Father. But yet in this moment, when he's carrying the sin of the world, your sin and my sin, when he's carrying that right there, and the Father has to turn his back on him because he cannot look upon sin, because it is ant the antithesis of God. At that time, Jesus feels, by His words, forsaken. See, sometimes it's kind of a comfort to me to know that the one I'm praying to 
also knows those feelings of complete despair. Do you ever get there? Do you ever get to the place that you're just not sure that God's still hanging and listening? Do you ever get to that place that you're pretty sure that you've prayed yourself out or you've done stuff and you're just pretty sure that God's not even anywhere close? See, Jesus knew what that felt like as He hung there on the cross. He knew more than we know. He knew better. Because it was there that He felt like God wasn't present. That God wasn't listening. That God had disappeared from His life. That, 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 that the Father was conspicuously absent. It was like the silence. God's silence was deafening. Have you ever felt that? When you were looking and searching for something from God and you just didn't get the answer as you needed it and you felt this silence from God was deafening? You see, Jesus experienced what we experience. Let's go on to Luke. Luke In Luke chapter 23, verses 39, starting there, Luke tells us this, One of the criminals hanging next to Jesus insulted Him. Aren't you the Christ or the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Responding, the other criminal spoke harshly to Him, Don't you fear God, seeing that you are also been sentenced to die? We are rightly condemned. For we are receiving the appropriate sentence for what we did, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And listen to Jesus' reply. Jesus replied, I assure you that today you will be with me in paradise. So this thief begins mocking Jesus. He starts off, but then as he starts watching Jesus as he's suffering just as they are, and as he realizes that by the sign at the top that he's really not done anything to receive this kind of penalty. And suddenly he's convinced about something of Jesus. He says, remember me. Now do you think that this guy, this criminal that must have turned his back on God's ways, do you think he understood the doctrine of the Trinity? How God could be here on the cross crying out to God in heaven and how all that works? Do you think that he understood all that? Do you think he understood the theories of atonement? Do you think he understood how God is, or Jesus was truly human and divine? Do you think he was ever baptized? See, he probably didn't understand any of these things. Now, I'm not saying they're not important, but, but what I want us to see is that, that Jesus offered this man, just when He called out to him, Jesus offered this man the same grace that He offers you and me. He told the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. Today, buddy, today. Matthew and Mark go on and tell us that Jesus died with a shout. It's almost, when you read that, it's almost like you just just grunt out loud or something. But John, when you go to the Gospel of John, he tells us what the word is that Jesus says. It's one Greek word, but when we translate it into English, we've translated it into these words, it is finished. I think probably a more literal translation from the Greek across would be, it is completed. You see, Jesus had completed what He had come to do. What He was sent to do. And I think this, instead of being a grunt of, it is finished, I give up. Instead of it being that, a, 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 a frustrated defeat, I think it's a victory shout. I think it's something, it's finished, it's completed, I've done my job. And then if He thought, now I can die and get out of this pain, I wouldn't blame him for that. But he says, it is completed. I have finished what I was sent here to do. 
You see, and what did He come to do? What was it Jesus came to do? He came to save us. That was His whole reason and purpose for being here on earth. See, our sin separates us from God. And so God came in Jesus to draw us back into relationship with God. See, God is not content to leave us separated from Himself. He wants to be in relationship with us. And so God takes the initiative to do whatever is necessary to save us from ourselves and from our sin and from from death and save us from hopelessness, to save us from despair, to save us from all those things in the human condition that bring all this darkness into our lives, that bring us to a place that we can do to another human being what they did to all these human beings that hung on crosses. Jesus came to save us from those things. And what we see in Jesus dying on the cross for us is I think the sacrificial theory of atonement. We've been kind of introducing some of the theories of atonement through this series. And this one, what we see here is the sacrificial theory of atonement. In this theory, Jesus is making an offering for us on the cross. He's sacrificing Himself in our stead. So here's the thing. When, when we've wronged someone else, we, we try to make amends, right? So used to what we'd do if, if we needed to, uh, we would, because things need to be written. You know, in, in, on the job, you know, I've, I've seen guys that had to write a, uh, an apology to another staff member, and and they would have to have to be written out. You know, so you know, I apologize, and so so I think today we just kind of put text, uh, my bad, right? And that kind of the apology of the day, my bad. But so so there's this when we've done something wrong to somebody, and we recognize that, then we find that we need to make amend in some way. And so, so what we have here is God offering Himself in Jesus Christ as a sacrifice on our behalf or on the behalf of all humankind. And so we have Jesus, the high priest, the sacrificial lamb. We have us. Here's Jesus. Here's us because we have sinned against God. And so we need to write this letter, but it's hard for we can't get to God we can't get there. And so Jesus comes and He takes this and Jesus is the letter that's sent, is sent to the Father and He becomes the sacrifice in our stead. Jesus is a high priest. He's also the sacrificial lamb. He offers Himself to the Father. He, he, basically, He says, Father, I offer You all that I am for humankind. I offer You my very life for these people that I love. It was God's way of showing to all of us the price He was willing to pay to save us, to redeem us. And this is what I call costly grace. It's not cheap grace. This is costly grace. When you start understanding even just a little bit, the tiny bit we touched on about the crucifixion, we understand that the, the price for our forgiveness is Great. Our forgiveness comes at a price of a man who loved us and gave himself up for us. Matter of fact, this is what Jesus was talking about when this was happening just 24 hours, just, just the evening before when, when he, Jesus was at the, in the upper room at the Last Supper and, and he was saying, This is my body. Remember that? We use those terms every time we take Holy Communion. This is my body. This is my blood. What he's saying is, This is my life. And it's given for you. I sacrifice myself for you. Jesus, back in in John chapter 15, Jesus is talking to His disciples and He tells them this. And this is a preparation for this time. He says, no one has greater love than this, to give up one's life for one's friends. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, he, and he continues, he says, but God shows His love for us because while we were still sinners, while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. So one way to explain the cross is Jesus offering Himself as an expression of the depth of God's love for us because our lives are worth saving. God gave Himself up for you because you're worth saving. God has placed immense value 
in you. Great value in you. That's what the story is about. That's really what the story is about. The last detail we see in the crucifixion is the centurion's response in, in this passage. As he's watching Jesus down the cross, now the four Roman soldiers that crucified Jesus, there were four of them that would do that, and, and uh, they were down below the cross or around the cross area there uh, after they'd stripped him naked and they were, they were uh, casting lots or gambling, or whatever, for his clothes, seeing who won, the, won his clothes. And one of them had to stay there and watch him until he died. And so one of them had been there watching Jesus struggle for six hours. And he would have been there close enough that he heard every word that Jesus said. He heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them. He heard them say that to the people who were putting him in such excruciating pain he could barely even breathe, let alone talk. And yet the words that came out of his mouth was, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. This Roman soldier, this centurion, watched that for six hours. And when Jesus died, the centurion said, surely this man was the Son of God. Now we spent six weeks trying to better understand the suffering of Jesus. We've done this during the Lenten season. It's the time that we would, would do that in the Christian year. I think it's important for us to see His suffering and understand what He gave Himself, or how He gave Himself up for us. But as we close today, there's only one question in my mind that remains. Just one question. I think we've covered about everything we need to cover on this, for at least for this year. This part. One question remains. It's this. What will your response be? What will your response be? See, my hope and prayer is that you, as you look at this cross today, as you think about the cross, that you see Jesus and the tremendous way that He loves you. I'm going to have you close my sermon for me, if you will. I want you to look at your neighbor and I want you to tell your neighbor, God really loves you. When you consider the price that was paid, when you consider the agony, when you consider everything, now remember, all this is going on at any time Jesus' words could have been, deliver me, and like that, the world would have been gone and Jesus would have been with the Father again. Instead, He says, Father, forgive them. God really, really, really loves you. Really, really, really loves you.